So I thought it was about time that I did a video on cricket trading. Now, as some of you may be aware, I haven't traded cricket much before. However, this year we've got the Cricket World Cup in the UK. It's a great opportunity to look at some high liquidity markets and to gather lots of data and look at trading styles on cricket markets. And that's what we're going to do in this video. If you're interested in learning to trade on Betfair, then visit the Bet Angel Academy, where you have detailed, structured Betfair trading courses. Or why not visit our website where you can download a free trial of Bet Angel Professional, but also visit the forum where you can get detailed images, examples, and downloadable files. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon if you want notification of new videos as they're released. So yeah, cricket markets um, are pretty big and that's what has generated a lot of interest. I have actually um, traded or looked at cricket before um, and the, I went back and looked at my data and the very first cricket match that I ever looked at was back in 2005. And I have gathered data on bits of cricket but never really dived into it seriously before. And that is simply because I'm too busy on everything else. Adding cricket into the mix um, is a nightmare. However, it seemed like a great opportunity this year because of the Cricket World Cup to really get stuck into it and really understand it properly. So what I'm going to do in this video is give you an overview of things that I've learned so far. I'm not going to tell you that it's like the most extensive overview and if you do this you will make it an enormous amount of money. But hopefully it will give you a better understanding of the way that a cricket market works. And more specifically in this case because it's the Cricket World Cup, One Day Internationals. Um, so yeah, let's have a look and understand um, what you see in a cricket match and some of the key characteristics within it. So cricket as a trading market is particularly huge. Now it's funny really because um, I can't immediately explain to you why this is the case, why it's cricket that took off as a sport to trade um, when some of the other uh, sports that are more popular in, in, general, in a general sense um, haven't reached these sort of levels. However, it's pretty obvious if you look at most of the high profile cricket matches is that you get a lot of turnover and especially in limited over cricket. Um, if you go back many years ago, uh, cricket was seen as something that's played over like 400 days um, by middle aged men. Um, it wasn't particularly exciting, but uh, cricket's done a great job of reinventing itself uh, with limited over cricket. So we've got the T20, you've got the Big Bash in Australia. Um, and you've got the one day internationals in the Cricket World Cup that we're seeing this year, which is uh, limited over cricket as well. So basically it forces the players um, to get those um, shots out and the bowlers to get players out and it just livens it up a little bit. And I think other sports could probably learn a lot from the way that cricket has reinvented itself uh, at this particular level. But yeah, the amount of volume that you get at cricket is absolutely immense. So if you look at the images behind me here, you can see that regularly um, at the, the one day international matches turn over about 100 million um, and you know the biggest market that we've had so far in the World Cup this year it's been over 140 million so there are loads of people asking whether we could see a match in the latter stages of the tournament I'm not going to talk about the tournament format in this video by the way but it's possible that we could see some absolutely immense markets as we head into the latter stages of the tournament so it's going to be an interesting one to watch out but yeah the thing that attracted me and finally got me looking at cricket in a little bit more depth is the enormous amount of liquidity and the interesting thing is i'm going to brush across a few you know topics in this particular video but it, this amount of liquidity opens up a whole range of opportunities i've discovered a lot of stuff already that works that's reliant upon high liquidity um and that is unusual and that you can do um which you wouldn't be to do in other markets. So it's interesting to see that. But also the interesting thing about cricket is like, you know, if you get a goal in football, the market's suspended, but a wicket in cricket, excuse the uh, the, the pun there, um, will generate a similar sort of move or, a, you know, a significant move, but there is no market suspension. So I suspect that's one of the things that um, helps this particular market. Because if you look at the mess that the suspensions create on football, especially with VAR, um, that is, you know, I think they really need to seriously work on that. And I think having unmanaged markets on football may work the same, you know, well in the same way that it does with cricket. I don't know. Maybe you have some views on that. Let me know. But yeah, cricket is huge. So we're currently in the Cricket World Cup at, the, at this moment in time. It's a one day international um, and it's limited over cricket. So to explain for those people who've never even looked at cricket ever or don't understand it, 
Uh, an over in cricket is basically six balls. So they will bowl six balls apart from if there's a wide or, and, and, and yeah, I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, and then they change ends and they keep on changing ends uh, every six balls, every over. And limited over cricket is where the team can only play for a limited number of overs. So the T20, as the name suggests, is limited to 20 overs. And the One Day Internationals of the Cricket World Cup are limited to 50 overs. So basically you have 50 overs to score as many runs as possible and for all of your players not to get out. So um, obviously the, the, your innings could end um, either at 50 overs or if you get uh, all of your players out. So yeah, you've, there's an incentive to score runs, there's an incentive to get wickets, and that's what makes it exciting. But yeah, there are significant volumes, as I showed on that previous slide. You know, we've seen the volumes range between sort of 50 to 100 million regularly, uh, and sometimes a lot higher, and I suspect that will be um, bigger as we go through the tournament. Cricket is also highly um, variable as well. There's a lot of variability in cricket. Um, and I think that makes it for an interesting market and that probably increases volumes as well. So when I was looking at cricket, um, I sort of saw a tennis market and I also saw a sort of football market as well. Uh, and I'll come on to explain that in a bit. But basically in tennis, you know, the, the match can fling around if a player gets broken. And in cricket, a couple of wickets in quick succession can fling the match around in the other direction as well. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to see how variable it is. Um, and But also how that variability maps to other sports that you may have traded in the past. The other interesting thing about cricket as well is the weather. The weather has an impact on cricket. The weather can af affect the wicket um, and how uh, teams are likely to play. But also, and you know, this was an interesting thing for me that um, I hadn't really spotted before, was that um, you can trade cricket when there is actually no cricket on. <laughs> so it's interesting to see um, just how um, remarkably um, active the markets are when you're looking at um, the completed match market. So you sometimes see this uh, acronym CMM, completed match market. But even if there is no cricket to be played because of the weather, the completed match market suddenly springs to life. So what you can see uh, on the slide behind me is when, um, I can't remember which team it was, I think it was West Indies, South Africa was playing at the Rose Bowl in Southampton. And you can see from the forecast, there was forecast to be rain all day. And you can see from the radar that I'm using on this particular slide, that the rain was moving in and circulating around the ground. So as a consequence, it's pretty obvious that there was going to be no play on this particular day. Uh, but if you look at the completed match market, you can see that there was 12.6 million traded on this particular market. And in fact, when they actually went to do the toss first thing in the morning, you can see that it looked like the match was probably going to complete. And therefore, the, the, the no market started to drift. But as soon as the weather set in, you can see gradually it came all the way back in. So this was one of the first completed match markets that I traded, did very well at it. Um, and that sort of sparked my interest as well. So even if there's no cricket, there's still a market to trade. Um, so, you know, that uh, is an interesting aspect of cricket that you may want to look at. So we've just talked about the weather and the weather also affects, the, you know, the very first thing that happens within a match, if a match is going to take place, which is the toss. So the two captains will go out to the centre of the pitch, they'll toss a coin, and then one, whoever wins the toss, can decide to bat or field. So that will depend upon what the wicket is like, because if the wicket um, is a bit harder um, and, you know, and, and not as green, then that would probably favour the batters. But um, if the, the wicket isn't particularly suitable for batting, then obviously, you know, there is a preference there, depending upon the prevailing conditions. I'm not going to go into great depth of that because... I've made a whole pages and pages of notes and looked at what people have said and the commentators and there's a lot more depth to it. I'm not going to give you some generic term to decide whether it's good to bat or field. It's very dependent upon what goes on the day. But the commentators and the ex-players that go out and examine the wicket give you a good steer on that immediately. But you can see that as soon as the toss is done, that immediately affects the odds of the team. So on this particular occasion, New Zealand were playing South Africa. They won the toss. And they decided to field first because they felt that they could do some damage to the um, South Africans. Um, and they may be able to limit the number of runs that the South Africans could get. And perhaps the wicket was more suitable for bowling than it was for batting. So, yeah, the toss is the first thing that you notice within a match that influences who goes into bat first. And that can give an advantage to a team with a new ball on a, a, on a wicket that's more suitable for bowling than batting.
So yeah, that's something that uh, I noticed straight away as well. But also what you tend to notice is when the game is underway, there's a sort of generic, it's not as simple as this because nothing is ever that simple, but there's a generic um, uh, method of operation that the market has whereby if a boundary, if a team is batting and they get a boundary, then the price will tend to come in because their run rate increases. But if there's a wicket, then obviously the chance of them winning goes out. So, you know, if you look at the graph that we've got here, you can see um, a, a variety of spikes all over the place, but they can be explained by, you know, the big spike down is when New Zealand lost a wicket. And then you can see their run rate improving, which pushes the price out. And then there's another wicket, which pushes the price down. So it sort of goes, if I'm illustrating with my hands, sort of, you know, a uh, few boundaries, few runs, wicket. A few boundaries, few runs, blah, 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 wicket. Uh, but of course, it could go a boundary, few runs, wicket, wicket, and then it starts to creep back up again. But generally speaking, immediately after a wicket, as long as they don't lose another one immediately, then the price will start going back in their favour as they get a few runs. And effectively, the run rate um, defines the end price of the team. So if they're heading for a very, very good run rate, then basically their price will begin to shorten. Uh, on the batting team but if the run rate is poor then the, the chance will drift so what I mean by run rate defines end price I'm sort of saying the chance of them winning the match is quite dependent upon the run rate and the number of rickets they've got left there's an interaction there but basically you know the higher the run rate the more chance they've got a winning which sort of makes sense really so if we examine this a bit further I'm going to describe a match as it sort of unfolded so that you can understand exactly what we're talking about here but if we look at New Zealand v Pakistan, which was, I think, yesterday, um, I've been capturing graphs, data, all manner of things on all of these markets. But you can see here, the price was pretty flat for a while, which indicates the period before the match started. The match started and then New Zealand um, got a... Um, uh, New Zealand went into bat and Pakistan got a wicket fairly quickly. Let's make sure that we get this right. So you can see uh, the price in Pakistan was fairly flat. It looked like a fairly even match. Pakistan get a wicket and then the price um, on Pakistan comes in. So New Zealand were batting, Pakistan get the wicket, the price in Pakistan comes in. And then you can see that New Zealand, um, the, the, the first order batters, uh, generally dig in and knock up some decent runs. So you can see that after that first wicket, the price started to head out again and started to drift off uh, into the distance. So this was basically saying that as the run rates were being accrued for New Zealand, uh, the chance of Pakistan winning the match um, was reducing. And that's why you can see the price in Pakistan drifting. Then you can see what happens when that uh, second wicket gets taken. And instantly you can see a little uh, bump on some of these points. So these would be uh, where they get fours or sixes. So you can see there's a sudden spike up, that would be a boundary, and then you can see the wicket plummeting down, you can see uh, the, the, how that has affected price. So yeah, you can see fairly clearly how the match is unfolding from this particular aspect. And then you can see we've got a third wicket taken, so we can see the first wicket, the second, and then New Zealand start uh, getting some decent runs on the board, and then that third wicket falls. And then you can see here that um, the pattern repeats itself over a period of time. So you can see wicket, uh, run rates increase, wicket, run rate, wicket, run rate. So, you know, it's a, it's a lovely illustration. This is why I've chosen this graph, because it shows you um, how the prices move. Because if you're trading it, you obviously want to, you know, lay or back at certain prices. So, you know, you could um, back hoping for a wicket within the next few overs, and then the wicket comes and then you trade out. Or you could wait for that wicket and then expect that for a wicket not to occur for a period of time. So it almost sort of feels a bit like over and under two and a half goals uh, when you're actively trading. If you're familiar with football, that's sort of how it trades. A little bit more complex, that's sort of how it trades a bit on cricket. But you can see at the tail end of this graph, you can see that the price in Pakistan winning drifts and drift and drift and drifts, and that's because there were no wickets and actually New Zealand were clocking up a fair number of runs. So yeah, you know, that gives you a view on how a market trades and what influences the price. It's more complex than that. I'm creating a model with all of the data that I'm gonna gather off of Cricut. Um, but essentially that's what you're seeing when you're looking at these odds and the way that those odds move. That will allow you to anticipate um, a trading position. You can sort of say, well, I think there's gonna be a wicket. I don't think there's gonna be a wicket. And then that would define your entry point within the market and the potential exit point as well. Like I said, a bit more complex than that, but hopefully that's given you an idea of the way that the market moves. 
Um, so yeah, when a team goes into bat first, they need to get a very high score. So one of the first things that I did um, was to actually uh, look at um, if a team scored a certain amount in the first innings, what was their chance of going on to win the entire match? Now, the fact is I am looking at about 10, 15 different me uh, metrics, the wicket, the run rate at certain overs, how power plays affect things, um, how many runs are scored in each individual over, because when a team comes out, they tend to try and not lose wickets and then they try and build their total. But if they've got five wickets and, and five overs left, they may as well throw away a few wickets. So, you know, I'm looking at all of those things. There's a lot of depth. Um, which I will examine and get some stats out of at, at some particular point. Uh, but the purpose of this video is not to go into those or into that detail, but just to give you an overview. But yeah, basically, you know, the more runs you get, the more chance you have of winning um, if you're batting first. And then it's all about the run chase by the second team. So if you get a good projected run total, the chance of you winning the match increases, but that's countered um, by wickets. So if you get a large number of wickets, then that will obviously reduce your chance of staying in for 50 overs and knocking up a high run total if you're batting first. So, you know, and obviously the pitch will affect the um, rate at which you score as well. So if you're playing on a pitch that isn't uh, easy for people batting, then obviously you would expect both teams to get a lower run rate and therefore that changes all of the odds as well. But yeah, in, in essence, hopefully this slide and that graph shows you that basically the higher run rate you get, which makes loads of sense, then the more chance you've got of winning the match. And that influences directly um, the chasing team's uh, total that they need to get and the run rate that they need to achieve as well. So yeah, you know, I'm looking at many different aspects, um, but there's just one of them that I'm looking at at this particular moment in time. Now, the great thing about cricket is there are actually an awful lot of um, sites that have great data on it. So um, this is the run rate from this particular match. So you can see running from left to right, from zero to 50 overs, you can actually see um, how the match progressed. So you can see basically New Zealand got off to a shaky start, their run rate declined, and then it started to pick up. So overfit that on to the chart that you saw, and the circles that you can see are where the wickets were taken. And that allows you to correlate what's happening with the price activity in the market and where it's gonna go. But of course, when you then look at the opposing team and you overlay that, this is all publicly available. There are loads of sites that, that do these graphs. You can see that Pakistan got off to a higher run rate um, and then were persistently higher for a long period of time. So you can see that when Pakistan went into bat, generally um, the chance of winning the match was immediately apparent that it was going to be much higher, much quicker. So you can see that straight away. Uh, the first graph I plotted, which coincidentally was available everywhere else as well, so I didn't need to plot it, so I'm not doing this any longer, is what they call the worm. So this is basically showing you um, the score after a set number of overs. And again, you can see here that up until about the 15th over, both teams were roughly level in terms of the run rate that they'd achieved. But you can see Pakistan was consistently above New Zealand for pretty much most of the match. So they were obviously playing better and, you know, they, they were favoured to win and as if suddenly they lost loads of wickets but you can also see from the little circles they've got on here that basically they weren't losing many wickets either and therefore the run rate was much higher they were losing less wickets it's pretty obvious they were going to win the match and therefore their odds would contract so yeah it's it's interesting there are tons of sites out there with all of this data on very easy to find we're discussing it in the forum if you want to come into the forum and, and find out what these sites are or what people prefer to use. But yeah, looking at the runway will allow you to get a view on where the match is going and which side of the book you lean on. Because when you're actively trading, you know, if you're looking for a wicket, um, you've got to counter that against the run rate that's taking place underneath as well, because that's going to work against you. That will form your traded window that you're going to be active in um, and, and vice versa. So yeah, understanding these things will help you trade cricket pretty effectively, but you will have to take a view on it. But there is tons of data. That's the great thing about cricket that I've found already. There's masses of data out there um, on every different aspect and even on the TV and wherever they give you a projected score. So that's pretty helpful as well. Also think about it. If you've got you know loads of wickets left and you're chasing a, a big total, then you may just throw caution to the wind near the end and that can have a dramatic impact. So you tend to find, and it's obvious to me straight away, that that back end set of, of, of overs is where a lot of runs can be scored because you've got nothing to lose at that particular point in time. So let's give you some simple hints in terms of how cricket is going to trade and what you should do about it. So in this example, you can see um, the graph that I've got up is England v Australia. Australia are favourites and England were batting. So if 
Australia get a wicket, then it pulls the price in. Um, and also wickets would uh, contract the run rate at which um, England could score for their remaining overs. So you can see on the graph where the wickets naturally occurred. But also look here as well, a boundary um, or a decent run rate will start to push the price back out. So Australia were favourites, a wicket pulls the price in. And if England get a few runs, then the price starts to drift out again. And you can see quite clearly, without me telling you how this match went, you can see where the runs were scored by England and where the wickets were taken by Australia. So essentially, you could pitch yourself in at any one of these points. Immediately after that wicket, you could sort of say, well, it's going to be another five minutes until the next wicket. So I'm going to nip in here and trade out there. Um, or you could do the opposite. You could sort of say, we haven't had a wicket for ages, so I'm going to back Australia at this particular point and wait for that wicket to occur, which point the wicket occurs, and then you can trade out at that particular point in time. So if you're used to trading over and unders on football, it's a bit like that. I say a bit because obviously it's not exactly like that, but hopefully you can see the parallels there between those two sports and the trading styles that you would adopt. So yeah, um, there are loads of data I've been collecting and information and views on different aspects of it. I've actually almost put a slide up with all of the things I'm looking at, but it would have just been dead boring because I would have read you off 20 different bits of data that I'm collecting and how they may or may not affect the price. But there's no point in me giving them to you until I've researched them properly. And probably what I will do at some point is put them on the Academy at some particular point for you so you can have a look at all of the information that I've gathered and some of the critical information that you'll need to be trading on cricket. But I hope that's given you a quick overview of how those markets work. The Cricket World Cup is on at the moment. There's going to be significant volume. Um, it's worth you having a look at them. Um, cricket matches do last all day. So my attitude to them is like I may trade the first innings or the second innings, depending upon what's going on within that individual match and depending upon what I'm doing elsewhere. Because during Royal Ascot, for example, there's no way I'd look at the cricket at all. But on a poor Monday or Tuesday afternoon card when there's just two race meetings. It's worth me nipping in and having a good nose at it. So anyway, I hope that's been useful for you.